Thank, thank you, Steve. Um, it's my great uh, pleasure to be here, and it's really um, pleasing to see the scale of uh, the num and the size of the number of people here as a testimony to the impact of the work of Steve and his colleagues uh, in this area, um, which has really been significant used throughout the, uh, data analysis in the life sciences in particular at this time. Um, I'm going to tell you about um, some of the, the we're, we're kind of celebrating our 10, 10 years an anniversary, uh, and we still don't know how to run a slide chart <laughs> at the uh, Allen, Allen Institute. And so I'm going to tell you about some of the resources that have evolved over that and maybe a little bit where we're going. Um, I'm not going to do this so much from just a, I'm going to do this a little bit more from a, a, a data a data analysis perspective to try to, to try to keep it uh, rather than sort of just discuss resources. I'm going to try to give a little bit of the like the insiders track into the kind of things that we were interested in doing and dealing with, uh, because I assume that the people wouldn't be here in a in a in sit like this if they if most people in the audience weren't kind of had an analysis orientation probably. So rather than just review the resources, I'll probably um, just do that. Um, that being said, this is a map of the resources here. Up to uh, a couple of years ago, um, I hadn't included some of the latest stuff just because I'll, I'll address it a little bit later. But we started out. People actually often I often get the question of like, how did we? What was this? What? Why did you start the way you did? And how did you start? And the reason that the Allen Institute started was because our uh, you know prime benefactor, uh, Mr. Paul Allen, who was a co-founder of Microsoft. Um, wanted to do something of impact in the life sciences and he wanted to do something that he knew could scale um, but would have impact and this is like 10 years ago and it's interesting how in technology projects and biotechnology life life sciences how 10 years ago which is really a kind of in, a minuscule amount of time is, is actually almost an eternity with respect to things think about imagine what it meant to have a terabyte of data 10 years ago um, and that was actually a, s a substantial amount of data um, and or other things, uh, you know, and basically the pro the project that was was decided on was to try to scan the brain in some way uh, uh, of of a, a mammal, something close enough to human that would matter, um, and do it in completeness, do it in genomic completeness, do it in brain completeness, and so the project that w came out of that, which is what we call the Allen Brain Atlas which is the original one, was, was a large-scale in situ hybridization map of, of the mouse brain. And then for there, for a number of years after that, we kind of uh, generalized. And, and when, you, when you do something, you, you try, to try to find variations for which you can capitalize on it that matter. And so we branched off into various projects involving in situ hybridization. Um, we did a, a substantial project in the developing mouse. We used in situ hybridization in the human cortex, et cetera, before kind of starting on some very different directions. Um, if you go to the main website, it looks, of course, like this. Many of you would per perhaps have visited it from, from at some point. Um, but we try to organize. This is done by our spectacular uh, technology team, which done really well. I don't. Um, at, earlier on, in the earliest days of the institute, I kind of ran more of, of the. Uh, sort of the, the, the uh, informatics developers. And today, I don't really do that so much. Um, we have another tech separate technology team, and they kind of um, manage the whole, all the technology and the website and stuff like that. And, um, but anyway, they, we, we, they have this sort of like kind of paneled kind of thing where you can go to the various atlases. And then some time ago, we decided it would be nice to have like a data vignette. And that's not necessarily something that any specific person would be interested in. It's just a highlight of something to get people drawn in. And here we're looking at kind of uh, expression in the uh, uh, burden and glia of the cerebellum in, in the adult mouse, a very characteristic kind of uh, pattern uh, there. Um, basically, the way this, uh, the, the Allen Brain Atlas was done was that it was this sort of uh, run on TCAN robots. It was a process that was no, which was known and had been developed by uh, Professor Gregor Eichler of the Max Planck and also the Baylor College of Medicine. And he had devised a way to run these on TCAN robots, but they hadn't really done so in any really big way. And as the result of a meeting uh, at one point, uh, what they call a charrette, a word I never really knew of up to 10 years ago, but it means basically a collection of people brainstorming about something um, toward an end usually. And the idea was to do this, uh, kind of, to, to, to take this to scale. Could you, could you do 20,000 genes? And we had endless discussions about with, with the scientific advisors as to, well, 
should all the, all the data should be done in coronal because neuroscientists tend to see, see more details in the coronal section than the sagittal. But it also should be available in sagittal because that and, and it's amazing how you you chip away your kind of uh, your your resources that way when you start to span and it gets even more so when one starts to span the developmental axis or goes to human etc. Uh, in any event, this process, which some of you may be familiar with, was run kind of on all these sections up to sort of 20 to 50 sections per, per gene for 20,000 genes in the mouse genome running basically, you know, almost 24 hours a day and generating, uh, even in the earliest days, about, you know, several terabytes of data a day, which was astronomical at, at the time. Um, uh, as time went on, we kind of become, became today, and those, re, those same robots are kind of retired now, and they enjoy a happy life doing something else. I'm not sure what, but um, the, we, the, we do other things with them. Um, and the, the interface to, these, to browsing these atlases is constantly being changed by the technology team as they gain more requirements um, and more interest in what people want from the field. Here you're just seeing sort of a browsing of uh, in situ hybrid. Can you raise your hand if you if you if you don't know what in situ hybridization is? Can you or, or yeah, people. So there's some. Yeah, so basically, what that is is it, it's a. You can think of it as a. I like to think of it in some ways of it's sort of an orthogonal process to sort of like microarrays. And microarrays, you 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 basically take small little transcripts and you put them on a, a type of a chip and you basically see what hybridizes to get many genes off of a single piece of tissue. But often, unless you do this at a cellular level, which is problematic in its own right, or people, people, people don't tend to do that at a cellular level anymore, they use other things, but um, usually sequencing methods, but uh, you basically, it forces you to essentially grind up tissue and, and you lose spatial, in, uh, spatial kind of uh, basically, uh, you know, impact of where you are. Um, and so in this in-situ hybridization, where that's done is that one sort of long sort of pangenic probe is designed and the tissue is opened up so that it can permeate the cells and it will hybridize uh, in, in an intact spatial, that's what's called in situ, in, in, uh, uh, intact sort of tissue. And so that can be done uh, in, in a way that will highlight what genes are sort of, exp uh, what gene is on basically by sort of binding with the mRNA in that cell. Um, the, the disadvantage, of course, is you can do one or uh, only several, maybe several at a time on the same piece of tissue. It becomes exponentially more complicated to make it work as you move to more and more genes in the same tissue. So we just ran one gene per tissue, but we interspersed the slides so as to make it uh, kind of uh, conserve brains. And then we would have these gross expression profiles across regions of the brain, a nice browsing thing. Uh, we, we map the data all back into three dimensions so that you could uh, see a little kind of uh, summary of the expression pattern there. And then there's a lot of other tools and access to the data, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, interestingly, sort of 10 years ago, people did not know uh, no one really knew the kind of the genomic landscape of the brain. Um, people didn't know, should, would there be that every gene would have some sort of unique signature? Would every region have a unique signature? Um, how many genes, what, what, what would, would transcription factors be ubiquitously expressing? No, no one really knew these kind of questions. And that was one of the big, I would say, big results of the survey was that we could tell by, based on essentially gene class and nature what color was the landscape. And maybe a comparatively small number of genes are expressed very, very in only specific locations in the brain. The expression is very, very combinatorial, uh, many different regions, uh, and complex. Um, but often, certain structures exhibit kind of highly systematic kind of, uh, uh, basically kind of markers in gene expression. Here we're looking at gene expression in the hippocampus, several set of genes which delineate kind of the structures in Ammon's horn, the dentate gyrus, uh, interneurons, and various glial cells. Um, and so you get kind of rep these representative patterns. Maybe about 10% of the genome expresses in this sort of marker-centric way. And it shouldn't, be, it shouldn't be thought that, that if you express in this local way, you're more important than a gene which is more ubiquitously expressing because many of the transcription factors, if you were to knock them out, the organism would be severely compromised. Yet some of these genes, it's not as clear what, they, what, imp what impact they have for the, the absolute um, life or death of, of the, the animal. Um, so 
to get at this data, some of the questions, it was decided early on that it was very important to have a, a large informatics component of this, that it didn't just suffice to kind of take the data, generate it, and, and, and put it on the web. In fact, the earliest kind of d d incarnation of the institute, it was thought that, that maybe that, that we wouldn't even be a laboratory. Maybe it would just be, in fact, data analysis that would be done. It would be run from Baylor College of Medicine. And, and that it was quickly decided that, that, um, that no, they wanted a laboratory. In fact, it should be kind of, we should run our own data. But the first thousand genes of this process, in fact, were run at the Baylor College of Medicine. So, the thing you want to do is you want to map this data to make use of it. And in discussions with the scientific advisory board, it became obvious questions became, well, you want to know what genes are expressed in the thalamus. You want to know what genes are expressed in the paraventricular uh, ventricular nucleus of, or, uh, of the thalamus uh, or the lateral geniculate nucleus. You need to be able to perform queries like this. And if you think about it, what that means is that the data needs to be spatially mapped. It needs to be spatially registered in, in such a way that you can access uh, th th it at kind of almost a voxelated level. So uh, Hong Wei Dong, uh, who is now in, in, uh, in the, the uh, Arthur Toga's uh, division of, of um, neuro, uh, neuroinformatics um, at, at, at UCLA, um, was the person who drew this reference atlas back starting finishing it about in 2007. Although this, this, and in fact, this plate, I believe, is about the state of it when he left it. It's been refined a bit since then. Um, a reference atlas is what gives you a, a name. You, you can access data, in, in, in essence, in two different ways, particularly in the brain. One is coordinate-based, such as stereotaxic coordinates or other coordinates that just tell you, with respect to sort of key anatomic landmarks, where am I? And typically, the choice of that would be like what they call bregma or lambda, which are basically just related to kind of a certain kind of bone location in the brain, essentially, it's all occurs uh, in the skull. But uh, another way is, is ontolo ontologically. In other words, through you basically, uh, you, you name structures. And there's certain problems with both. People don't think on a coordinate-based way. They like ontologies. They like names of things. On the other hand, ontology is both variable from expert to expert. And it's problematic in the sense that it's, it's very, it, it's sort of tissue depend specific. You can't really, once I've called something, it's not clear exactly what the, bar, the, what the, the boundary of the lat lateral genicleate nucleus is. But in any event, um, Hong Kui went, went through, and so when they draw these atlases, they make a, a great deal of use, they, lar very lar they, they use this as a nissel stain on the left-hand side, a large-scale kind of histological stain, which stains most most neurons uh, in the brain, although it does not stain their processes very well, the axons or the dendrites, you just get the soma, the cellular body. Um, and then this, these are, we scan these at about 10x magnification, and then, then, then the neuroanatomist will draw these based on other information also, other, other cytological markers such as protein expression or, and other knowledge in the field uh, to do this. It's, it's funny, because when I remember, uh, when, when we first started, I, I uh, remember t t telling this problem to some of my friends at uh, Microsoft Research, and they would say, well, just send us the data. We can learn where those regions are. And I said, you're not going to learn where those are. It's, it's voodoo. <laughs> you know, I mean, I don't know what you see on the left-hand side, but I don't see, I, can, I think I see the hippocampus, okay, that, that thing right there, you know. But there's a lot of stuff that you, you, it's more, very subtler, you know. And they said, you know, no, we're smarter than you, just send it over, we'll do it, you know. So it's very typical in, in, in often in collaborations, you send your data over and then you don't hear anything. There's no, no, no radio sound, no one ever calls you up and says, you know, we're having trouble with that problem we gave you, you know, if you, ever, if you ever noticed that. But you, uh, yeah, so it was a long time goes by and I guess we decided that in fact there is prior knowledge. You know, you have to, you have to know something to be able to do this. And uh, it's very complex and there, some of it is debatable because neuroanatomists will debate about the, their certain a boundaries. But the, so the reason we did this was so that we could map data into a common reference space and then query it in the way that, that I, I mentioned. And, it turns out, the first thing that you would tend to think is that, okay, we'll find some way of deforming our data into this common space, and then we will uh, simply have labels like what we did. Notice that these are, basically everything is RGB, a unique RGB, every single sub-compartment there is some unique RGB value. 
even with the, the magentas are slow, are part, the, all the magenta in the center is the thalamus, and there are only small variations in colors, but they are distinct. And that's so you can recognize in constant time exactly where you are, and you can look it up in search algorithms. But you would be tempted to think that once we get the data at that space, all we need to do is bucket the gene expression by those regions, and we'll be okay. We'll be able to search gene, uh, uh, you know, gene expression, and, 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 and it will be done. And that actually would, it turns out that if you do that, you're going to be in trouble. And because the one thing that we didn't realize that the reason, is just, which was the nature of this com combinatorial complexity of the brain, and that's that too many things express too many places, and you, have, you, you lose complete specificity in your search that way. If you were to say, show me everything in the lateral geniculate nucleus over there on, uh, on the right, in fact, you would get things expressing high in the lateral geniculate nucleus, but it would not be specific at all. That you need some way more powerfully to localize your, your data, and I'll have some more to say about that in, in a minute. Um, so, in any event, what we did, we took all this data and we built this giant pipeline that could, in an automated fashion, uh, basically register these in situ hybridization sections by image processing, image registration methods into the space of that reference space. So first of all, we had to take the reference space and build a 3D model out of it. And so for that, we used an MR, an MRI of the mouse, uh, sort of a high resolution thing. And we, we aligned those extremely well cut sections. And so what, what, a, what a neuroanatomist does, they go into the lab and they cut those sections and they keep cutting because it's almost impossible to cut a complete series of a brain and have it look right. And so you just keep cutting and cutting and cutting until one day, lo and behold, you've cut essentially a perfect series and then you say that one's the one. That's the, the that's the, the 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 dignified mouse that will be the reference standard. And because these are all C57 black laboratory sort of mice, they're all virtually identical. Um, never never a more normal distribution will you ever see if you measure any of the parameters of it. And you basically uh, decide that that's your fixed element. And so we then we have these we have these uh, this algorithm that essentially reassembles sort of in an iterative way the in situ hybridization sections as it deforms them into uh, this reference space. So then you're almost done, but what you need is you need to find your signal. And for that, you, we have a kind of signal detection algorithm which could scan these and recognize based on the shape and the, essentially the, 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 and the density and the color of this punctate, this in situ hybridization punctate, because this was a colorimetric method. It was done in bright field light microscopy. Now there are, there are other in situ hybridization methods that work radioactively and they image it in dark field, but the thing is that we've decided that 20,000 genes worth of radiation was not very interesting and we decided not to go that way. And so we used this. Now, there, there's been a long debate about the quantifiability of in situ hybridization, especially in the color metric. A lot of, a lot of results have indicated that a radioactive method can scale uh, essentially linearly with signal in some range, and that the, uh, the, the color metric methods are, are more um, qualitative. And, and that is true. It would be, it would be difficult. The, re the reason is that in part of the process, to get the signal, you have to amplify it. And that amplification step is a bit nonlinear in the sense that you really don't get more, more, more RNA, mRNA does not directly uh, sort of scale in a, in, a, in, a, in a completely predictable way with a signal. And so the best you probably would be able to say is a bit of a relative more expression or less expression uh, or medium, let's say. And so, but the signal detection algorithm recognizes these punctate places. And then to get away from our ontological problem of just using the reference atlas, we decided, and I'm glad we did, because at first we really didn't, um, we didn't know that we were going to, we, that we thought this was important, but we basically just went into a gridded space. Instead of using the ontology alone, we, we broke up the, gri the grid of the reference atlas into 54,000 uh, little voxels at 100 micron on, cubed on a side, and then we would populate those voxels based on the expression that it was determined by the, the, the algorithm here. And so that now, now you have, once you get the whole system, it looks something like this, is that you can query any specific location in that brain, and you can get an expression summary of the, uh, the um, what, what genes are kind of expressed in that voxel, and then you can query from what anatomic region did that voxel come from. So if I want to know what's in the lateral selective nucleus, I unionize all the voxels in there, and, uh, in, or, and then I can read it out. But this gives you more power, this grid-based method, because now I can use other things, correlation-based methods and other kind of slightly um, more um, 
uh, direct methods to compare gene expression in the brain rather than simply ontologically. Um, this picture here shows this, this Brain Explorer application that we built, which was a 3D application. You can download it from the web. All of our stuff is open and free. Um, that's part of our kind of our, our mission is to provide stuff. And in fact, a lot of the scientists is, in particular become kind of a little bit irked because they, they, they want, sometimes they want us to hold data before they, so they can finish writing it up. And as it turns out that in practice, something interesting has turned out, though, that, that in fact, that people rarely scoop you on your own data, I think, because it, you, you know more about it, typically. If it's, if it's a small and it's a more direct thing with a targeted hypothesis, then maybe that's a bit more of an issue. But in these large-scale data things, um, typically you have a bit of an edge because you're the data generator. And so it never turned out to be so much of a problem. But, um, and we want people to do that anyway, so it's part of our, it's more important to us that others do it than that we do it anyway, so. Um, but anyway, so this is just showing at a 200 micron grid level now. Now, a, a sphere here does not mean a cell, it means a pooled value of gene expression in that voxel. Every sphere should be thought of as corresponding to the gene expression in some little voxel of 200 microns on a side. And we can see that this monocytase 1A we can see that big, that uh, reddish band there, which is actually the hippocampus, hippocampal structure in 3D, kind of coming there. And so all, any gene or multiple genes can be viewed and, and other kinds of data that we, we do later in this. And so then, somewhat then after that, we decided to make, we make this data available to people so that through basically appl application uh, programming interfaces that you can query, so, and you can query the data at a voxel level, you can query it at an anatomic level, you can get the labels for the whole mouse atlas. So you can go back and forth yourself using this kind of data. Um, now, I'm very interested in, um, in kind of atlasing in general and kind of in, 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 in thing, and I've kind of worked with different groups on this and stuff. And one of the things, there's an, an, an organization called the, the, the Informatics, uh, uh, International Neuroinformatics Coordinating Facility in Stockholm. It's called INCF. And it's a program that kind of they 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 have they've set up this program where they kind of have member countries and different people contributing different things, uh, and, and and to to sort of try to advance neuroinformatics in some grand way. And one of their projects is this sort of uh, digital atlasing thing to try to build a standard that everyone would use for the 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 the, the C fifty seven black mouse or perhaps a rat atlas too, which has been in the works now. And so th for this. We regenerated this really high, ultra high resolution MR of, of the mouse brain, and we've been building these different tools to kind of access it. And the Allen Brain R Atlas is mapped into this. And for example, and now we're interested in moving more in detail into the visual system, and so we're actually going to do another high resolution map of the visual system and, and layer it on top of this. So if you want to learn more about this, you can just go to INCF and, and you can see some of their programs there. There's other things about uh, all kinds of several interesting data initiatives there. Um, in essence, what you want is a common, what we call a common coordinate framework, though. You want, it, it, the, the ideal is a, it's a kind of a common reference space for experiments where researchers can tag and, and hang off their experiments off specific uh, kind of uh, localized uh, locations in the brain. It's a type of spatial database, like a LIMS or a laboratory information management system that you can use to kind of to, to label data and to access it. And it, and it becomes kind of a, present, a presentation vehicle as well. This just sort of shows various use case scenarios one could imagine from that kind of perspective. Oops, for some reason that came out funny. But, um, so anyway, back to the data a little bit here, is that, as I said, you know, here, here, let's take another look at monocytase 1A here. Is that here, we, we saw that it had that hippocampal expression, but in fact now we can see that there's a bit of band of something going on through probably layer 5 in, in the cortex up there, and the striatum is, is broadly expressed others, as well as potentially some other areas in the midbrain over there. Um, and so the question is, well, you know, how would you summarize this, or how would you access genes, or how would you find expression of genes that were like that? And so that's where we started to build out these methods that were more kind of correlate, correlative based. And there's essentially sort of two directions which you can do this in, 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 in this way. Is that one is you can say, if I have a, a image series of something of a gene in the brain, I can say, find me more genes like, with a pattern like this. Um, so in other words, we're, we're ignoring the ontological description now, and we're saying, uh, you know, in fact, 
this is not, you know, what we're, we're, we're looking for things that are going to let the data, we're looking more for a data-driven uh, kind of description of the data. And so this basically just uses either some form of correlation metric or information theoretic method to say, giving a pattern that I see, I want ones which have a, a, a higher probability of, uh, of looking, whose voxel pattern looks like that. And this turns out to be very, very powerful. And you can use this to kind of localize and isolate data much more of your interest in all. And these are kind of tools that are available on the website on a gene-by-gene -gene basis. Here I'm doing it with this nephroblastoma and uh, ETS variant 1 gene, and I, and I, and I run it and I can, I can get back other image series which, which have a strong kind of relationship to that. And then sort of the website kind of looks something like this. You can select a gene and, and you can localize it too to say I want to perform this correlation search like a partial correlation, only restricted to a region that I'm interested in. And so if I do that with this, this um, let me do that with this, this one gene, this sort of tryptophan hydroxylase, right, which we know is in sort of a, the rate, that governs the rate kind of at which serotonin is, is produced in the brain. It's expressed primarily deep down in the, in, in the midbrain or near the brainstem. And this gene, if I, if I search for this and I, and I say look in midbrain area and I say find me all genes that, that are expressed in this way, I will get a list back that'll look something like this, and these are its correlations on, on the right-hand side. And um, th then I can go back and look at these images, and I see that just like tryptoph tri uh, tryptophan hydroxylase on top, they all have a pattern which is somewhat different, but given that this is the only place in the brain that they express, these are remarkably similar patterns to uh, the first pattern. And so if I use like one of the ontological tools to examine the, what the function of this might be, it turns out these are involved all in, you know, satiety, uh, serotonin-related kind of activities, okay? So this is a kind of an example of a success story of uh, gene ontology analysis. A lot of times one's, one's results are more ambiguous than that, but you can sort of find. So that's one aspect of the thing. So in, in a way, there's a kind of a three-pronged kind of uh, uh, approach to this. And, and let me tell you what I, what I was thinking about by this sort of duality idea. If I imagine that I have c c like the, the voxels, let me take the voxels of the brain and just put them in a big list like this. So I'm ignoring all the spatial component, but I just line them up this way and I line up genes this way. So I get a matrix of genes by voxels. I can think of this as genes, I can think of this as space. And so when I do this correlation neuroblast thing, what I'm saying is I give you a row of that matrix and you're saying find me other rows whose, say, correlation looks like that row, right? But I can also look at it dually. I can look at it this way. Let me look at a spatial location. And I can say, what other spatial locations across a class of genes have a similar behavior or similar expression profile? And that's really interesting because that, that's essentially letting, that's saying, what do the genes tell me about the organization of neuroanatomy? And so this, there were hopes earlier on that in fact one could significantly refine or remap the anatomy that the neuroanatomists knew about the brain using gene expression. And in some cases you can say some things, but it turns out that they did a pretty good job based on conventional methods, that in fact there weren't any real real major surprises. And, and, it, and it, with a very, it turns out with a very small number of neur neuronal markers, Genes that, that, that are actually are just, we know to express in neurons and not white matter genes, right? Uh, white matter cells. That in fact, with a very limited number, if I simply know the gene expression in, 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 in those genes, I can, very, I can map the gross architecture of the brain really pretty well. In other words, I can recapitulate most of the big anatomy of the brain just using a very comparatively, maybe 15 to 20 neuronal markers, which is kind of surprising. Um, but anyway, we call this other method, we called it the anatomic gene expression atlas. And so when I named this neuroblast, people liked it. They thought it blast, they thought it was kind of cool. But when I came up with this one, Agia, they didn't like it. They thought it sounded like a, a car. Um, and, but it stuck because no one, no one renamed it. So, it, but anyway, it's called the anatomic gene expression. And, they, and there what you do is you basically can select, it's kind of neat, uh, uh, one of our, our team, uh, kind of our, our, uh, our web team kind of uh, driven by Lydia Ning, basically what they did was that they built, essentially what they, they have is they have a, a reference brain in which you can touch, if you look up a G on the web, you can touch any voxel and then you see another brain, which is uh, a second location. And you can, you can basically navigate that second brain to see how the gene expression is related to that primary location that you expressed as, as I move around it. 
And so that's what this is here. For example, here I have the cursor placed probably right here in the thalamus in the center of the brain. And so I can see, I expect to see that gene, that spatial locations whose activity is like the thalamus will light up in nearby locations. No great surprises. But the nice thing is that you can, it will, uh, you can get the genes back that are, that are driving that pattern. Without that, it would just be kind of a bit of maybe an eye candy, but you can get the genes back. Um, so, in fact, we use this to kind of explore, there was a, 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 uh, an open kind of hypothesis about the nature of the organization of the striatum. And I just told you, I said that no, no, no major neuroanatomical surprises were really had, but in fact, I wouldn't call this a major neuroanatomical surprise, but it was a bit of a refinement thing. Is that, so in a, in, a, in a survey uh, kind of article by Vorn in 2004, there was this, this individual uh, was kind of challenging the kind of conventional uh, um, sort of dorsal lateral kind of organization of, of, of the uh, um, striatum. And the, and the idea was that, you know, is, we know that there's kind of this two kind of gross areas, but there was also evidence for kind of more graded kind of uh, uh, compartmentalization too. And so we used the gene expression to explore that and, and we're able to find some kind of re refinement basically that essentially both of these uh, neuroanatomic organizations were active at the same time in, in a way. And so that was, that was published in a, in a neuro, nature neuroscience paper at the time. Um, Hong Wei Dong, uh, who is from, from UCLA, um, used this uh, to uh, look at the kind of the architecture of CA, CA1, and they, and he, he, in combination with some other kind of uh, genomic markers and, and just histological studying, used the, the GIA atlas to, to, to explore these different functional domains, and he published this result in, in PNAS in 2009. Um, so, like I said, when you can do something, you tend to sort of around going to see how you can extend it. And so what we did was we, we took this and we started to explore the developmental axis of the mouse. And so for this, there were seven different time points uh, and from basically E11.5, the embryonic 11.5 mouse, up to a, a two-year-old mouse. And so the, ca the catch is that every time you add something, you get this you know, kind of curse of, of dimensionality, it's more like curse of, curse of dollars kind of problem where you can't do the same thing you did because you've now added a whole other axis of exploration. And so here, uh, we, we basically wanted to, to, to add time now. So now you've got potentially genome-wide, spatial, and time. And so something has to give, something's got to be compromised. And so what we decided was that we couldn't do the whole genome, but what we would do was, would be to uh, restrict ourselves, motivated by the adult atlas, to those genes that either were known uh, a priori to have some developmental function or were shown potentially to be interesting from the adult. And so th there were about 2,000 genes, a lot of them transcription factors, um, because we're interested in how the cell kind of cells developed into the mature, mature state. Um, and these were spanned, and, and, and the tools themselves were generalized. So there's a, there's a, a neuroblast over time, and there's an agia over time. And so you have this added complexity where now you can search multiple time points at the same time, or look for a pattern across time. So it's definitely a generalization. And the same kind of things where the data comes back, et cetera, and you can browse it and mine it like that. Of course, we needed all new reference atlases to do this because you have to map them to something. And this was done by uh, Luis Puelles from the University of, uh, University of Murcia in Spain, who had a kind of uh, topological ontogenic perspective on, on development, which means something I don't completely understand. But it's, it has something to do with the notion of, 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 of actually using the gene expression to kind of drive uh, the, the, no, uh, the notion of how regions mature and uh, become more locked down. I found over the years that it's kind of difficult to find two neuroanatomists who actually agree on anything. But it's, um, they, so what would happen is we did this and the results, they didn't really converge with the first atlas uh, 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 that Hongwei Dong had driven drawn because they had different, slightly different perspectives, like I said. And so we have a reconciliation kind of thing where one can see which kind of version you want and we can convert between the two. And I, I fundamentally believe that that's kind of the way that all, we have to do all atlasing in the sense that, that there's never going to be for really any, a completely really fixed notion of what some of these structures really, really are. That it's better to have different skins, if you will, where from a certain viewpoint you can look at it 
and you provide these interchange vehicles to query the other with. There's a, there's a brain explorer for this, another 3D kind of application tool. And this, it, this is just an illustration of kind of the search and the, uh, showing the kind of gene expression profile over time, over the major uh, anatomic compartments of the developmental mouse, the prosomeres, the, those which will become uh, the cortex and other kind of places, the brain, the, those which will become the thalamus. Um, and you can sort of see over, over the age groups from up to peach postnatal uh, P28. Uh, as I mentioned, there's a kind of this AGEA function where you can, we've been kind of working on uh, using that to kind of analyze some of the data. And in fact, we, we use, this is a place where the, the, the WGCNA was very, very helpful in terms of identifying uh, sort of modes of expression that were kind of common over, that how, to, to look at how, how did these network profiles kind of mature over the developmental stages. What did they become? You can either run consensus networks or you could run them independently and look for changes and stuff like that. And we did that with some fruitful outcomes. Um, something that we just have really been, we're just about ready to, 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 to finish up is this, which has been a pretty successful new thing, is it's a, a connectional atlas in the mouse. And this is basically using kind of uh, uh, sort of track tracing methods and also based on kind of uh, genetic tool methods to, to, to show you what, 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 where, what are, where are the axonal projections from one region to the other. And so viral injection traces are, are kind of uh, made and that you, you basically look uh, into ant anterior grade as to where they're uh, sort of projecting to. And, then, and so this, this, this called for a whole other kind of suite of tools to, to, to detect that signal and to map it back. We had the reference space, but the signal was a very different nature. Um, and uh, the, it kind of organizing that. So that we would use transgenics to get certain markers for certain things and also use uh, these um, uh, viral data. But so this data was interesting. It was run on um, these machines that are these called tissue mesh type machines. And this was a small company in Boston called Tissue Vision that we kind of partnered with. And this technology is actually not even, technology is always changing. By the time you start using machines, someone's got something better. And you really wish you had it. But, so we got six of these. But, um, and they're almost reaching the end of their kind of livelihood. Um, but what these do, it was really neat. These obviated the whole need for all that data registration that we had. And I wish we had had these when we did the mouse atlas, the original atlas. Because what these do, was is that essentially they use two photon microscopy to, to sort of image about maybe just a seven microns below the surface of the plane. And, but, but they take a block face image, a picture first before they cut. So, so you see, a, you, exact, you have an exact shape of the brain as you move through and image it. And so that really, really helps the registration problem. Essentially now, all you have to do is kind of linearly reassemble your slices into a consistent 3D volume. You don't have any of that other dimensionality uh, sort of spatial variation problem that, that we had to deal with. And so these ran, we have six of these that ran all the data for the connectivity thing. And so if you go to the connectivity atlas, you can kind of see this kind of, these browsing of sites and, and, and such like that, where you can look up injection sites, you can organize the data that way. Um, typically, it tends to form this big bolus of a signal right at the injection site and then the projections come off from that. And then the data itself can be viewed in these kind of independent planes like this, in, like in, in a planar browser similar to what we had before. This is just showing kind of a, a primary injection site in the somatosensory, primary somatosensory cortex and some of its kind of projections, off into the cardioputamen, off into the motor cortex, uh, et cetera, different places. It's really neat. It's very, very high quality data, and and I say that because we, we you know some of the things we did originally it was difficult to get it to to to, to work just right. But this is good data, I think. Um, now, the we, I was saying we were in, we want to move into more uh, detailed explorations in in the in the visual system of the mouse. Not so much because the mouse's vision is such an uh, an analog to human vision, but because it becomes. 
a kind of a, a paradigm for cortical computation uh, in, in a mammal, in the, in the mammalian cortex. And, but the, the current delineation of the visual cortex in our atlas is very crude. That's about what it would look like if you were to kind of delineate it. And so we're trying to build a, a much higher resolution version of, of the visual cortex and to kind of layer it on there in the same way that you'd have another coordinate system like in a manifold over a patch or something like that. And so we're doing these kind of what they call colossal injections to inject one side of the brain and see where it projects to the other. So that, that's the way, one way that people have used to determine the, the kind of a functional, a functional areas of a brain is that you do injections on one side and you watch the projections as they project over through the corpus callosum to the other side of the brain and because most of these regions will be connected. And then you can image the places where they, uh, where kind, where they kind of bundle up on the other side. And then here you can see that just, this is delineating several areas in the visual cortex, primary visual cortex V1, and some of the higher visual areas up there. Now we believe there's about 10 to 12 visual areas in, in the mouse kind of cortex in its entirety. So all this data is organized, again, in this sort of grid-like framework. And um, you can, and it's been kind of segmented and presented in this Brain Explorer, this 3D application there that you have up there. And then this is just showing kind of an organization of the data by its projection, both on the ipsilateral side, meaning the same side as the injection, and the contralateral side, which is the projection uh, to the other side. And this data matrix is, is very good. It's, it's showing that, there, that, in fact, the data is consistent in the sense that what you see projected to the other side is basically the same organization of, of uh, the side from which you injected on. And this, this data is also, uh, I think, is, is, if it's not available now, it will be shortly in this API form for people to go in and, and browse it too. So in the remaining time, let me just say a little bit about moving into human and different things that we've, we've done there. So you, this was all, everything I've described so far has been in the mouse. You have a question, yeah. Yeah, there's big differences between all. Again, all these things are, are very complementary in the sense that, that there's no real gold standard per se. But if talking about the, the brain architecture uh, um, thing is that a lot, that, that is uh, mo mostly in the rat for one thing, which is very similar to the mouse, of course, probably the, the results are gonna be, but there are some differences, you know, and, and that's also, it's, mo it's, co it's collected results. It's a resource which presents collected results from uh, the literature, from studies, from data that people enter. And this is data that was run in systematically in, 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 in a single organism of, of, of the mouse. So it has, this has the advantage that you're studying the projections from the framework of a single animal, a single experiment. It has a disadvantage that you're not collecting data from other sources, per se. Um, you know, there's also a m huge interest right now, you probably have seen, in, in the human connectome. And, and, and is that, what does that, you know, and, and sev there are several big efforts kind of have been underway in that. One of which is this human connectome project, which comes out of um, Washington University and the University of Minnesota, kind of spearheaded um, by David Van Essen. And what that is is that they're using um, primarily M MR and fMRI methods at really high resolution to determine kind of global architecture of the brain from a networking perspective. Um, again, connectome can mean different things, right? This is more of a projectome, if you will, in the sense that it's just saying what projects to what. When, when people talk about connectome, they usually mean neural connections, you know, synapses to, to to, to axon kind of thing. And that's very, very difficult to image, except at the very finest scales in a very isolated kind of uh, case. Um, so th we, we decided that, that we wanted to kind of do this you know, in the human, it was, it, and, and our uh, people, they said, well, you know, now that you do, should scale up. And, and you, you decide, well, well, okay, what would that mean? We, well, well, we'll do in situ hybridization in the human, okay? And to do so, you would say, well, if, if we were to do what we did in the mouse, and we were to kind of scale up and, and, and say, I'm going to do one to one, n equals one to 1 1.5 in the human, well, the human, the human cortex is about a thousand times bigger than the mouse cortex. So if you do the math, in the cafeteria at the back of the envelope, instead of $44 million to, to build the mouse atlas, you need $100 billion to do the human atlas, which 
you throw the napkin away very quickly at that point and decide this is not going to go anywhere. No one will fund this, you know. And, and the question is, what would it be worth anyway, really, if you have a n equals one or to one point to two atlas and two people in in situ hybridization? I, I think you'd have to you'd have to question who would it be, you know? With the, these are not laboratory animals. There's no we know that there's massive variation in the human brain. Um, it, it would be questionable as to what you would do with it. So we had to try other approaches. And so one of the things we did was that I think maybe uh, uh, Jeremy will probably talk about some of this um, tomorrow or later, maybe even after this uh, talk, um, about uh, is that kind of the data analysis of these methods. But what we did is we, we used microarray technology. And when we started this, the RNA-seq technology and digital sequencing methods were coming on board, but they were very expensive. And we just opted to, the technology wasn't completely mature for high throughput use, so we decided not to do this. So we ran microarrays on this, and we picked about, initially about 1,000 locations, maybe 900 locations in the first two to three brains. And then we realized that, in fact, we weren't seeing many differences between the hemispheres. And so we started, we, we started only collecting data in a single hemisphere of the patients after that. And this atlas has now about um, data for up to, to, up to sort of six humans. Um, only, unfortunately, only one of them is a female. Um, so it's really difficult to make comparative studies between males and females based on that. But, um, it, but it has the advantage of being genomically very broad and spatially very broad, okay? So you can query different locations from which these samples were taken. It's still doing microarray, so you lose the spatial kind of information in that area, but you, there's sufficiently many locations that you can really see what's going on across the brain. And then we combined that with in situ hybridization of the subcortex and other areas for which we knew we could do in a more systematic way. And then we map this back, but not using the same kind of methods, not using all this data transformation methods, but some of this was actually done by hand or it was done by ontologically, by knowing where it came from. Um, so this required a lot of different kinds of technologies and stuff. You had to have large sections, you know, you need big flat bed scanners, you need um, big cryostats for sectioning these essentially six by eight kind of sections. Um, I know these are really common. For example, Artoga has, lot, has many such machines in his lab uh, here. Um, and we could map the data back by, by either by di big, big dissection or labeling, et cetera. So we basically used two different methods. One was this macro dissection, just kind of cutting, and the other was a laser capture micro dissection where you use the anatomy in a kind of a program microscope to isolate a specific kind of uh, section. And then we put that data back in the Brain Explorer. You could visualize this. Here's this meta-oncoprotogene, um, which in fact turns out is probably the most differentially expressed gene in the, in the entire human cortex uh, shown in two patients here. So it's just a dramatic pattern that is not really uh, similar to too much else in the human brain. It's been implicated in, in, uh, in various things by Alzheim in Alzheimer's disease and other things by Dan Geschwin's um, lab. Um, and then we kind of did some analysis here, and, and Jeremy uh, actually helped uh, quite a bit on, on this uh, too. Um, but this is just showing a, a map across three human subjects here of, of surveying kind of the differential expression in the human brain. And so what we're looking at here is that the brighter it is, so you, this, this, it's a symmetric matrix. The two axes are uh, basically labeling up to sort of 140 different regions of the brain. And an entry in there is brighter or more red if there are, it's simply counting the number of differentially expressed genes. If there are more differentially expressed genes, it's hotter. If there are fewer, it's, it's, it's cooler. And so you can, in the upper left-hand corner, all the cortex up there, you can see this very homogeneous kind of a map in the cortex. That there's just not that much that's different in the cortex from a gene expression point of view. And this is consistent with lots of earlier studies in gene expression in the mouse, in the macaque, and other things, showing that, that it, it looked at in this kind of way that different er areas of the cortex don't tend to have that much differential expression. Most of the gene expression occurs across the layers. It's kind of, there are a lot of laminar effects. Um, but you do see a couple of bands there. One of them is the primary visual cortex, which has a, a big difference. And then another dramatic thing of this is that when you go down into the lower part of the brain, 
uh, with the exception of the cerebellum, which is again a big homogeneous structure down there, you have this really kind of complex behavior where it's, there's a lot of cell type specificity and a lot of different kind of uh, characteristics that define very precisely. In fact, down there, if you do kind of a hold one out experiment and you say, I only know the expression in a few genes, find me where, tell me where my, I'm not even going to tell you where I got the sample from, tell me where, I, where, where my sample came from. If you restrict yourself to the subcortex, you have a, playing that game, you have a very, very high kind of learning rate. You can basically get it up to maybe 70 or 80 percent. So did you look at the concordance between the um, eigengene modules that Jeremy Miller did with the human and mouse data with the human and mouse spatial data that you have? We have to some extent a little bit. Note this does not involve WGCNA, this, this method here at all. This is just purely doing essentially, a, you know, a massive number of uh, statistically corrected t-tests, in essence, between these different areas and making such a matrix. You can do that. You do see a, a lot of kind of similarity in some of the, uh, of the, the modules. You, there's one characteristic uh, that's very common in the human is this kind of somato, motor somatosensory module in the cortex, which is very, very prominent in all humans, and that doesn't really occur in the mouse uh, per se. Um, but there a lot of the, several of the structural markers are, are, are there, striatal, certain um, uh, kind of white matter signatures are there. So say there's like 500 genes in the hippocampus module. What's the concordance rate of those 500 genes in your spatial um, in situ hybridization? Yeah. In the I hippocampus? Yeah. I can't, I, I can't give you a number on that. Um, but. I do know, so the question, his question was, I don't know if everyone heard that, he's asking for the concordance uh, between, say, you, what you would find running a WGCNA on, on the human versus what you would, how many would belong to that in, in, in the mouse data derived from in situ hybridization. I'm not sure the number of that. I think in some structures like the hippocampus, you would expect a pretty high agreement. Uh, because the hippocampus, hippocampal markers are, the cell types in the hippocampus are so well defined and so uh, conserved uh, across species. So that, it would be very successful there. Other places would not be as much. Maybe Jeremy knows something about this. I'm not, it's not something I, I, I don't have the numbers off the top of my head, but yeah. Um, again, we did, we did run the WGCNA in this human data and found very interesting concordant kind of modules using the consensus approach. I think Jeremy will probably talk about that, but none of the things I'm mentioning here, I'm not scooping his talk, so I didn't, do, I didn't, I didn't t put that in here. Um, here's another aspect here uh, that we did is that you could say, going, I like these studies that say exactly if I know kind of the nature of gene expression, where does it kind of, where, where, where does it come from? Or what can I say about spatial organization? And so here I'm using kind of a multi-dimensional scaling or a projection into the principal components of the gene expression space to actually say, can I recapitulate the genetic architecture of the cortex? Can I, can I recapitulate the spatial architecture of the cortex knowing only the gene expression? And you can actually do this quite successfully in the human cortex, is that here I'm mapping, I've shown that, that there's a strong spatial uh, location component to uh, expression in the cortex. And that basically, if you factor this out, there's not a lot of signal at the data collected it, it, the way we've collected it at this level. It, it's more, much more, it becomes much more noisy. But, from that data alone, you can actually essentially use kind of spatial mapping methods to show that you're about 30 to 40 percent correct in terms of reconstructing the geometry of the cortex, just knowing this. And Jeremy's repeated the same thing with RNA-seq data and found the same result, which is kind of interesting. So anyway, my time's kind of running up here, um, but there are other atlases too. There was an atlas of human development. Uh, which are called Brainspan, which was developed as part of an NIH, uh, NIMH consortium, which spanned, used RNA-seq and microarrays to look at human fetal and uh, a kind of data over time. That had also new reference atlases of the fetal human, other things. Um, uh, this sort of slide, I encourage you to look up some of these resources uh, there. Um, it's again, you've got the flavor of it now. I think it's just more of in, in the same kind of spirit new atlases. There were two new reference atlases drawn of the fetal kind of human. And so I think uh, this, these last slides here, which I don't really want to, I don't really like to go over time, so I'm not going to go through these, but these were just showing basically how the data is organized in the kind of application. 
uh, it's you're organized by there were exon arrays run, so it means microarrays run where the probes are actually localized down to the exon level in the gene, and uh, the, and, the, and the data is sort of presented genomically, kind of like this, and you can do searches on it, correlation searches, etc. Um, so just moving forward, um, as a resource summary, all these data sets are available. They're public for the mouse, macaque, and human. There's all sorts of tools, both on ontological, anatomy, and coordinate-based tools for looking at the data. D uh, detailed APIs are available for most of these so that you can programmatically access the data and do or change some of this analysis yourself. And moving forward, we're trying to look more into kind of functional studies of, of how the brain is organized. Um, this last slide here just shows that one of the new projects we call MindScope, and the idea is to kind of to use neural principles of neural coding and cell types to sort of try to understand the functioning of neural circuitry in the mouse visual cortex of a behaving animal. So there you have an animal that's uh, in doing some sort of behavior like running or foraging, et cetera, or some combination, and you, you use various techniques from calcium imaging to uh, electrophysiology to gene expression to try to put together the circuit dynamics that we can uh, kind of explain. So this is an enormous uh, amount of work by an enormous number of people and um, it's just my privilege to be able to talk to you about it and here are at some snapshot in time here are all the people in the Ansel Institute and it's, there's more here that are not represented but of the, of the work I talked about this would be primarily their work so. Anyway, thank you.